So here's the second part of the video on 14.5. This time we'll look at binormal vectors and torsion. So if the principal unit normal vector and the tangent vector together form a plane, so I have a drawing here that came from the textbook. The blue vector is the normal vector. The red vector is the tangent vector. If you want to find out how fast this curve is moving out of a plane formed by those two vectors, what you'll find is the binormal vector. This binormal vector here is perpendicular to the normal vector and the tangent vector that form a plane together. So that would make sense then the binormal vector is the cross product of the normal vector and the tangent vector. The second picture here actually shows the plane, right? That's the plane. That blue thing is the plane formed by the tangent vector and the normal vector. And the binormal vector is coming out of that plane. The rate at which that binormal vector changes is the torsion. Okay, so we'll first take a look at the binormal vector to figure out how to calculate that. And then we'll look at how to find the torsion. All right, there are formulas for torsion. These are the various torsion formulas. The missing blanks here are actually dots. So this is a dot, that's a dot. And this guy here is a dot as in dot product. So it's the dot product of those formulas. Over here, this is another way to find torsion. You gotta find the, the tangent normal vector, which is the first derivative of r divided by its magnitude by the normal vector by taking dt dt over its magnitude and then the binormal vector is the cross product of the tangent vector and the normal vector so my example up at the top is the curve 2 sine t 2 cosine t which is a circle it's just a circle that starts at 0 2 and moves to the right so instead of starting at let's say 2 0 and moving up it actually starts at 0 2 and goes to the right all right, so let's find ourselves some space over here. We've got r of t. That vector is given by 2 sine t, 2 cosine t. So the first thing is the velocity vector, which is r prime, is the derivative of what's up there. So the derivative of sine is cosine. So I get 2 cosine of t. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Then I want to find the magnitude of v. Well, this is nice, right? Because square root of a squared plus b squared for cosine squared t, that'll give me a 4 sine squared t. Cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. 1 times the square root of 4 is 2. So if I want the tangent vector, the unit tangent vector is just v divided by the magnitude of v. So it's 2 cosine t divided by 2, negative 2 sine t divided by 2, which gives me just cosine of t, negative sine t. All right, so this is t. Let's make a note of that and hang on to that for a second. The next thing I need to do is I'm going to need to derive that. So I need the derivative of t, yeah, let's switch colors, the derivative of t with respect to t. That's going to be the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine, the derivative of negative sine, which is negative cosine. All right, now if we want the normal vector, we should take that and divide it by its magnitude. But the magnitude of this the magnitude of dt dt is just 1. Because if I do sine squared plus cosine squared, I'll get 1. Square root of 1 is 1. So it turns out that the normal vector is simply negative sine t, negative cosine t. All right, so now I've got a tangent vector. I've got a normal vector. The binormal vector is the cross product of these two things. So the binormal vector is the cross product of the unit tangent vector cross the unit normal vector. So I'll set up my ijk. My tangent vector is going to be cosine t, negative sine t, 0, and then negative sine t, negative cosine t, 0. What's going to happen is the same thing that happened in the examples in that last video. Because we're dealing only on the xy plane, when you do 
row one, column one, you'll end up with a bunch of zeros down in this corner over here. When you do the J, you'll end up with zeros from the first column and the third column. It's the K that's going to give us a value. So when you do the K and you do negative sine T times negative sine T, you'll get positive sine squared T. And then minus a negative cosine squared T, your binormal vector is the vector 0 in the i, 0 in the j, 1 in the k. Now, when that binormal vector sticks out of the xy plane, it's not changing. It's constant. So since that binormal vector is constant, the torsion, which has that funny looking piece on top of the t, it's a Greek letter, that torsion is actually 0 because the binormal vector doesn't change. If you want to know how much the binormal vector changes, well, if the binormal vector is 0, 0, 1, it doesn't change. It's constant. So the torsion is 0. All right, what if I had something a little bit more complicated than that? So let's take a look at one nice long example here. Suppose I've got something that involves hyperbolics, right? Go back to Calc 2. You did hyperbolic sines and hyperbolic cosines. Those were defined in terms of e to the x's and e to the negative x's, but a lot of the rules that they followed were the same as unit circle trig, with one big exception, actually a couple of big exceptions, but one big exception being that the Pythagorean identity doesn't hold. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. In hyperbolic terms, hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared is 1. And I know when I taught Calc 2 in the spring, I did a whole set of... Um, proofs as to why that worked. If you have questions about that, let me know and we can go through that. So I want to find the binormal vector and I want to find the torsion for this curve up here. T, hyperbolic cosine T, hyperbolic sine T. So I wrote out all these steps. This guy down here is a dot product. I don't know why my dots are not showing up here, but I swear they were in the PowerPoint the first time I made them. Let's start working through the process. So I'm going to come down here and just use my whiteboard space. Remember that my original problem was the vector valued function R of t was t hyperbolic cosine of t negative hyperbolic sine of t. So my v, right, that's my R prime. I'll try to label it both ways depending which way you like. The first derivative is 1. The first derivative here. That's the other thing is that when you derive hyperbolic cosine, you don't get negative hyperbolic sine. It stays as a positive. So when you derive negative hyperbolic sine, you get negative hyperbolic cosine. Our double prime is the same thing as A. And so you'll end up with a zero hyperbolic sine of T negative hyperbolic sine of T. All right, so I get zero hyperbolic cosine negative hyperbolic sine. At some point, we're going to need a third derivative. And so we might as well take it now. I'm going to get zero hyperbolic sine of t negative cosh t. Okay. So I've got my r, my r prime, my r double prime, my r triple prime. If you went back to the formula, you would realize that at some point, you're going to need to take the dot product of the magnitude of v cross a and the third derivative of the original function. All right, so I'm going to need a v cross a, so let, why don't we figure out what v cross a is? All right, v cross a requires a cross product, so I got i, j, k. My v, I'm going to copy from up here, is 1 hyperbolic sine of t, negative hyperbolic cosine of t, and my acceleration is going to be 0 hyperbolic cosine of t, negative hyperbolic sine of t. All right, and now I need to do my determinant. When I set up my determinant, I'm going to get i times what? Sine times negative sine is negative hyperbolic sine squared minus the other way will give me a negative hyperbolic cosine squared. So again, I'm knocking out row one, column one. So negative, negative makes a positive hyperbolic cosine squared. All right, always minus the second. So minus j, 1 times negative hyperbolic sine 
is negative hyperbolic sine. When I do it the other way, I just get minus zero. Okay. And then plus k, now you knock out row one, column three, and you're left with one times hyperbolic cosine of t minus zero. All right, well, this is kind of nice because remember that Pythagorean identity in terms of hyperbolics is that hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared is just one. So V cross A is the vector one. Notice I got a negative here and a negative there. So negative, negative makes a positive. And then the last term is just hyperbolic cosine T. All right, then my next step is to find the magnitude of that. How do I find the magnitude of that? Magnitude of V cross A is just the magnitude of the vector. So magnitude of the first term squared plus second term squared plus third term squared. Now, remember the formula was hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared is equal to 1. What if we added a hyperbolic sine squared to each side? Then we got hyperbolic cosine squared is 1 plus hyperbolic sine squared. And look at that. It shows up right here. So those two things added together give me another hyperbolic cosine squared of t. So the magnitude of v cross a is going to be the square root of one hyperbolic cosine squared plus another hyperbolic cosine squared is two, two hyperbolic cosine squared. I can simplify that a little bit by writing it as a square root of two times the hyperbolic cosine of t. Great. What do we do with all this? Well, I want to find the binormal vector. Right? Go back to the formula that you had way, way up top by now is that the binormal vector is the cross product, right, V cross A, divided by the magnitude of the cross product. So my cross product vector, importing it from way up on the top, is 1 hyperbolic sine of t, cosh t. And on the bottom, I have a square root of 2 hyperbolic cosine t. So why don't we pull that 1 over the square root of 2 on the outside? What am I left with in my vector? I'm left with 1 over the hyperbolic cosine. Well, 1 over hyperbolic cosine of t is just hyperbolic secant of t. Okay, So that's my first term. If I take the middle terms, sine divided by cosine, sine over cosine is tangent. So I get, that's hyperbolic, hyperbolic tangent of t. And then the last terms, hyperbolic cosine over hyperbolic cosine, is just 1. So this thing here is my binormal vector. Then the torsion is the dot product of the cross product and r prime divided by the magnitude squared. So here, maybe it's worth rewriting the formula because that's way up on the top by now, in that the torsion is the cross product dot r triple prime over the magnitude of the cross product squared. And I think I go through in the PowerPoint and explain how the whole thing happened. Um, let's write out what we know. We know the cross product. And you realize I did all the calculations at the beginning because a lot of these things are used more than once. So once you have the calculation done once, you just import your answer from the previous step. So I get 1 hyperbolic sine of t, hyperbolic cosine of t that was found in a previous step, dot r triple prime, which we figured out at the beginning of this, 0 hyperbolic sine of t, negative hyperbolic cosine of t. Maybe it's worth doing this dot product first and then taking that answer and dividing it. So this turns out not to be bad at all, right? Dot product is first times the first, so 1 times 0 is 0. Hyperbolic sine times hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic sine squared. And then hyperbolic cosine times negative hyperbolic cosine 
is negative hyperbolic cosine squared. Oh, well, if hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared is equal to 1, would it make sense that if I reversed it and did hyperbolic sine squared minus hyperbolic cosine squared, I would get negative 1? And that's exactly what happens. The numerator is negative 1. And so the torsion then is negative 1 over the magnitude of the cross product squared. Now, we had come up with the magnitude of the cross product as square root of 2 hyperbolic cosine. That thing is going to be squared. So I'll get negative 1 over 2 cosh squared. And then if I want, I can get rid of that fraction by just making it negative 1 half. What happens if I have a hyperbolic cosine in the bottom? That's the same thing as having a hyperbolic secant. And there is my torsion. So my torsion is not zero. The torsion changes, and it changes based on what the value of the hyperbolic secant is. All right. So I thought that would be helpful to work at an example that involves binormal vectors and torsion. And yes, if you need that torsion formula on the test, I will certainly give it to you.